see if I can get the audio right today. Hopefully I turn the right volume down. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we are going to be recreating this painting, Ghost of a Flea, from somewhere between 18, 18, 18, 19, 18, 20, by the great visionary artist and poet William Blake and in celebration of Halloween I could think of no other painting more appropriate than this terrifying um, image and the story that goes along with it which I will recount as we go um, is uh, certainly one of the un most unique moments in art history and William Blake um, <laughs> was quite the the character in real life and a person who claimed to be able to see visions of of dead people and of creatures and and, and angels uh, and uh, in celebration of Halloween it just seems like this is an apropos artwork so let's jump in this is the the plan for today's episode we're going to get some color we're going to do the image transfer then we're going to stain it with a little bit of color We'll talk briefly about the biography of William Blake. I've done two previous episodes on him before, and I, I think I probably talked more than at length about the, the biography of that great artist. Um, underpainting, maybe a little bit. Background, certainly, foreground. I'd like to say we're going to be done in about four hours, which means we'll probably be done by tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, so please... Take a moment to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. Take a photograph of your work this Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. We're going to be doing our feedback episode finally. Um, and so if you want to participate in that, uh, join the Facebook group. Take a photograph of your work. And the rest is history. And I go through that whole thing. And no, no matter if you're recreating the paintings we're doing in class or something else that you're working on i'd love to 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 look at it celebrate it and give some feedback where it's warranted right i uh, also if you want to support the channel with a small donation you can use the paypal link down below you can donate through super chat while the live stream is live you can send an e-transfer or an old-fashioned check in the mail uh, by contacting me through my email which is on the website and on the facebook group my, my website and on the facebook group <laughs> okay, so it feels like forever since I've done one of these. I feel like I'm a little bit out of sorts. I think it's because I got a haircut and it's so cold in my studio, my brain is freezing. So uh, the, our first step is the image transfer. So let me show you where you can get a copy of the free downloadable image. So here's the painting we're going to be working from. And here's the drawing that I made on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. And there might be some differences. I mean, I couldn't quite figure out what was going on. Is this a fingernail? Is that a fingernail or a ring? You're certainly welcome to make up your own mind and paint what you see. This was a very small painting. So um, anyway, there's the image. This is what our Facebook group looks like. And in each class, I post a little biography or a little bit about each painting. And here's a little bit about today's artwork. Um, but we're going to go to the Dropbox folder, which is another link there. The first files up here are, are just the, the basic things to get you started into acrylic painting. The next, I don't know, 100 folders here are all kind of more basic paintings that I think you could attempt if you're just starting. And then the next, I don't know, 200 folders... Um, all have more complex images, and that's where I've put today's in here. And of course, like this, you can see there's some of those folders have three, four, five different paintings in them, including today's. So here's the three files related to today's episode. You have the original, and then two versions of the outline. One's a JPEG, one's a PDF. Whatever's easier for you 
to print out on your printer at home. So that's what it looks like when you've printed it all out on just regular photocopy paper. And so I'm gonna put it onto this nine by 12 sized canvas board or canvas panel. And you can see that I've also, I, it usually comes wrapped in plastic. I take the plastic off, I give it a light sanding with some 100 grit sandpaper. And then I apply some, another coat of acrylic gesso, white acrylic gesso. You can see how it's sort of dripped around on the back side. I let that dry overnight. And then I sand it with some 220 grit sandpaper I get this really nice smooth surface and when we're painting especially if we're painting portraits you know faces you know or whole figures like this where the face is relatively small not too much bigger than my thumb the smoother the surface the easier it makes uh, painting because um, you're not having to paint up and down over all that texture so Let's put this roughly in the middle. I might actually move it to the right just a little bit. So the figure is, is, is quite centered there. So I'm going to use some uh, graphite transfer paper. I know this is carbon transfer paper, just because it's the I've since used up all that carbon paper, and I'm now using this graphite paper. I think it's a hundred sheets I ordered off of Amazon for like ten bucks, and I will be passing that down to my granddaughter, <clears throat> assuming my daughter has a daughter <laughs> or grandson, um, because I'll I'll never use up all of that carbon paper. Um, Okay, because you can reuse the same sheet multiple times. And you want to put the dark side facing down. And it's always a good idea just to double check. Oh, yep, yeah, it's working. Because there have been times where I've done the whole tracing, been super excited, peeled it off, and realized, oh, I had the carbon paper or graphite paper upside down okay story behind this painting is is pretty fascinating and we'll get to that when we talk about the biography of William Blake and uh, <laughs> definitely in, in a an unusual figure in the history of art and the and I was watching a bunch of uh, lectures about William Blake over the past week and it is really amazing how William Blake, uh, you know, he died relative, basically in poverty, kind of uh, um, having been largely ignored throughout most of his life. And yet now he's seen as sort of arguably the single most beloved artist in the history of England which has a long extensive history and um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about you know how did that happen why wouldn't how did this artist who was basically ignored throughout most of his life ridiculed throughout most of his life um, uh, you know uh, ascend to this uh, to to this position in which he's now seen as as uh, you know, the prototypical English artist. It's said that one of uh, the poems by William Blake is the 
unofficial national anthem of England, and that people from all sides of the political spectrum see William Blake as uh, someone that they hold up with reverence, which, you know, as one of the, the lecturers said, is, you know, think of how many people in any society can be, are so beloved by the right and the left, and I don't know, it's, that's a good question, I mean, this goblet now the goblet of blood that the flea has is drinking from oh yeah these uh... lines down I really should have checked before I tore that off. There was a few things that I missed, but uh, um, I guess I must be impatient here. Uh, okay. Let's, do I want to use? Maybe we'll keep that ruler in case. Okay, now. Let's, um, yeah, let's go to the next step, and then we'll talk about it there. Now that we've got our image on the canvas, we want to stain it with some color. And uh, maybe just before I do that, it's just worth talking about what paints I'm going to use. So I'm going to use what's called a split primary palette. That means we've split the so-called primary colors in half into warm and cool colors because every color has a temperature. So we're gonna use two yellows, two reds, two blues, and a white. And I don't usually use a black because I like to mix my own. We'll see if, th if there's a need for it later. I, I doubt it, but it's possible. This might be one of the few we might use it, but we'll see. Um, so I'm gonna use this particular brand of paint, this Amsterdam um, paint, considered to, by some to be a student, I see at Michael's Art Supply, they call it a professional grade paint. Either way, it's, I think it's the best bang for your buck. This is about, this is the 250 millimeter tube, and it costs somewhere between 12 to $17, depending on where you're buying it from. Maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, depending. Um, but, you know, if this is, for instance, you've got golden paint, this is a tube of paint that costs about $30. And so, you know, you can see it's half the size, twice the price over, right? So it's going to be higher quality, but most of you are probably not going to notice that difference anyway. Typically, I use this warm yellow, uh, this Azo Yellow Deep for my 
um, uh, for my input amateur, but let's just see here in a moment if that's indeed the color we want to use. So as mentioned, here's what I would use if I was using golden paints, or if I was using Liquitex, or Windsor Newton, or Artist Loft, or Buzz, or Holbein, or Dyla Rowney, or Fevacryl, or Nova Color, or Chroma Color, but I can't recommend a museum color, neither Peebo. I, they just put way too much titanium white into their paint. And that's that's quite typical for an, especially lower grade paints to mix titanium white into the paint in order to make the color more opaque. Uh, but it does make it impossible to mix our own gray. And I find every color just looks a little bit dull because it's got white in it. White, when we Blah. When we add white to a color, it lightens it, but it also reduces the saturation, right? And I usually like really bright, saturated colors, so for me, it's just a non-starter using these particular brands of paint. Okay, let's just take a look at the original and just make sure that... Yeah, so this is a particular painting where using a warm yellow seems really appropriate. In fact... A lot of this, he was using gold leaf, and I was considering maybe trying to use gold leaf in here, um, but part of the the reason why this painting looks sort of so, it looks all cracked and degraded, and is because of the innovative use of materials that William Blake was using for this artwork. So, um... I'm just going to paint this in a very straightforward manner and not use some of those special uh, non-traditional materials within the paint. So yeah, I'm going to use my warm yellow for this one. And in the chat there, oh look, we've got Kathy and Lisa and JM and Patty and Barbara and Clancy all in the chat there. JM says it's my first time joining live. I'm so excited. It's midnight here. Perfect atmosphere for a creepy painting. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Absolutely. Um, and Clancy says, yeah, I saw that when I went to Michael's recently. I didn't know if it was considered professional, if this Amsterdam paint was considered to be professional. To be fair, I buy expensive acrylic to craft paints. I don't care as long as it performs well. Totally. That's the main thing. Uh, when it comes to brand names for acrylic paint, as long as it works and you're happy with it, that's all that matters, right? Okay, so this is that this is Amsterdam paint that I'm using here. This is just what I do when I've got these tubes of paint and they're I've squeezed everything I can out of them. I cut them open and then using a little spatula, I scoop out all the extra paint in here. And you could see I've got jars worth of this, right? Paint tubes that would otherwise have gone into the trash. So I encourage you, just before you toss that tube of paint in the trash, take a little extra second to see if you can, you know, cut it open and salvage something inside, because you often can. Man, my studio is freezing now. I guess this is the beginning of winter. Oh, it was nice to know you, Summer. Oh my goodness. So I'm wearing long johns, a long sleeve, a thermal underwear top, and I've got my my giant thick wool socks on, and I'm still feeling cold. Welcome to Canada. will be my oops okay making a mess this will be my uniform for the next uh, six months okay. so I'm using this um, warm yellow and you can see I put a little bit of water in there maybe 60% paint, 40% water, somewhere around there. Sometimes I use a little bit more. Sometimes I use a little bit less. Um, this one, because there is such, essentially this bright gold color, 
throughout most of this painting, I'm making it maybe a little bit more, a little bit less water than maybe I normally do so that I can really have um, a really solid yellow input amatura. But those of you who've been painting with me for a while know that, you know, I've sometimes done, used less or more water. And also, even especially recently, I've been using different colors, experimenting with some um, greens and blues and reds. And um, typically, artists would paint uh, a warm brown. Probably, I think my hypothesis would be that it's intended to mimic the look of wood because for centuries artists painted on wood panel before they started painting on canvas and that's primarily where the imprimatura makes its first appearance kind of giving a quick stain to the surface of a painting give it a little bit of a, a color that may or may not be consistent like not necessarily all artists apply the imprimatur evenly over the surface as I do either. I mean, just like every single art tool and technique, there are some artists that that do it exactly like I'm doing. Um, and then there's most artists really will kind of take a technique and adapt it, change it, Frankenstein it into their own technique that suits them best and their own workflow. So, you certainly don't have to listen to me about anything. Um, but this is what I feel works best for my own particular practice. It complements the colors that I like to use. I like to use really bright colors. So this warm yellow coming through, I find just very uh, seductive, very attractive. I like this kind of golden color that that appears kind of uh, underneath and between the brush strokes. Okay. Let's see, I just like kind of cleaning up a little bit as I go so that, because uh, uh, one thing I don't particularly personally like is when I see paint all around the edges of the painting. Sometimes that kind of confuses me when I'm painting. Um, because all the colors I see around a painting um, can help make me misperceive the colors inside my painting. Uh, what else? Um, uh, Clancy says, I use a toothpaste squeezer to get the rest of the paint out. I do the same thing as well. In fact, I've got a tool especially made. It's uh, this ancient medieval torture device <laughs> that you kind of put your paint tube inside like that, crank it through. It does get, again, most of the paint out, but still, I, sort of, I still end up cutting it out because you'd be, there's usually, at least in my experience, one or two entire paintings worth of paint that still remain trapped inside of a paint tube, even after I've used my paint uh, toothpaste roller as well. Uh, you guys talking about Guy Fox? Uh, was it l maybe last Halloween we did a, um, a painting of Guy Fox, um, which is also the image that maybe more people today recognize as the face of... Um, Anonymous, or of from V from Vendetta, that uh, kind of big smiley face, right? It is obviously based on Guy Fox, but was um, popularized by the comic book V from Vendetta. And anyway, I talked all about that history in a separate video, right? Uh, but that one turned out really great too. So if you're interested, if you're find this a little bit too creepy and you want something else, I think I've done three Halloween episodes over the past three years, so there's lots of material out there. Okay. Let's um, move on here. 
Now what I want to do is I want to talk about William Blake, briefly about his biography, but really obviously focusing on the story behind today's painting, Ghost of a Flea. So, let's... Um, just as a quick review, William Blake, born in 1757 and dies in 1827 at age 69. Born in London, dies in London, you know, definitely identified very closely with the city of London, England. Uh, to be honest, off the top of my head, I can't remember if he traveled much at all. Um, he, William Blake was was a eccentric individual, a bit of a, certainly an outcast, an iconoclast, a person exploring his own um, uh, world, his own visions, uh, totally unlike all of his contemporaries, many of whom ridiculed and dismissed him. He was not particularly popular during his lifetime. The way that he made his work, he was also a very important um, figure in the history of printmaking. Um, but the methods that he used for printmaking were time consuming and not efficient at all. Like he, he tried to self publish, or he did self publish many of his own artworks, uh, but they didn't sell very well, and the way that he made them were, were so laborious and time-consuming that he would almost result to half-hand painting the prints after they were made, that there was just no way he was going to make money on these projects. So he ultimately dies uh, penniless. I think he might have even been buried in a pauper's grave, like an unmarked grave, uh, and was largely sort of ignored, forgotten throughout his lifetime, and even for a little while after he was born, after he died. Uh, but certainly since he dies in 1827, he's gone on to become, you know, one of the most, I mean, like here in 2002, William Blake was placed number 38 in the BBC's poll of 100 Greatest Britons. So... Um, oh, and then here it says he lives in London his entire life except for three years spell spent in Felp Felpen? Felpen? Felpham? <laughs> How do you say that, English? A parish in West Sussex, England. Okay. Felpen. Felpham. Um, uh, yeah. I, I mean, William Blake, I find as an individual and his artwork absolutely fantastic fascinating, absolutely uh, just infinitely interesting. I find him very inspiring as a figure. I think the fact that he did what he wanted to do regardless of how, what people thought about him and his work. He was determined to express his own inner vision uh, and was resolute, very determined, and didn't really care what people thought of him, and uh, I, th I find very inspiring. I think as an artist, I think a lot of artists admire William Blake because of that, that he's sort of seen as sort of like an artist's artist. We sort of talked about that with our last artist, Pierre Bonnard, who's also seen as sort of like an artist's artist, like an artist who might not be appreciated by, you know, the general public, but by Bonnard was beloved by many of the great artists of his time, such as Henri Matisse, who saw Bonnard as sort of like probably the greatest living artist. We mentioned Picasso couldn't stand Bonnard, but that's a little bit like William Blake. Like I think especially after he died, there were kind of a small number of people that, that kind of tried to preserve his legacy and I think it kind of started off where you had a number of kind of a younger generation of artists who looked back and really saw him as like the prototypical artist who is not willing to compromise, like an extremely stubborn individual who um, there's a very famous uh, series of letters that have been preserved by of William Blake's where he was commissioned to do some artwork 
for um, for this fellow. I can't even remember the entire details of it, but um, William Blake, anyway, did basically the exact opposite of what he was hired to do. And of course, this fellow wrote a letter back. We don't have the the, the letter that that Blake received, um, but William Blake responds basically like, "Listen, everybody sees the world differently, and you know some people look at um, a." A car crash and are horrified some people look at a car crash and see the the sublime beauty in it and obviously William Blake died a hundred years before a, well 80 years before the first car but I'm just speaking um, in metaphor uh, that William Blake just per point out like yeah you might not like this but I do and we just have a difference of opinion we just see the world differently and that's what it means to be to live in a democracy is that we're not always going to agree on things and so over time blake his reputation was recuperated until as i said he's now considered to be you know certainly the, the most uh, yeah i think probably the most important artist in 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 england and i think i think partly because i also i went to school at the royal college of art when i was um in gr in graduate school uh, i went i went there and I, I i lived in england london for a year and not and and i'm also a big fan of english comedy and um i my, my I remember my father always watching monty python growing up i think from just what I can see about and have observed from first-hand accounts about uh, English people is that they are uh, always have a very good sense of humor about themselves. They seem to t kind of they they kind of relish the role of the underdog. And you consider England at one point was the most powerful empire on earth, and you know ever since you know, maybe the American Revolution has sort of given up virtually all of its uh, possessions, as one might say, uh, former colonies around the world. And and that is sort of was a bit of a ego blow to England and to the English people. And even though that happened a century or more ago, I think there's still that kind of feeling of um, uh, of. Uh, you know, a, a proud people who are no longer sitting on the, the the highest throne of the land, and so I think maybe there's a part of that that that, that English people respond to when they think of William Blake as someone who um, was not really fully appreciated or wasn't appreciated at all during his time. And that now, in hindsight, we look back and are like, wow, that guy was really important. So I think there's there's a kind of an identification of William Blake as sort of being like the spiritual father of like modern England, I think. Um, uh, the, anyway, so what else do I want to say? Again, we've talked about all of his biography here. So let's just talk specifically about this painting. So this painting, Ghost of a Flea, is in the collection of the Tate Gallery or Tate Museum in England, and specifically it's on dis permanent display at the Tate Britain. Tate Britain, uh, unlike the Tate Modern, is really focused entirely on British artists. And as I said, obviously, William Blake being, you know, up, I don't know who would be jmw turner might be him and constable gainsborough those would be your your big heavy hitters um historically from um classic art um so i just want to also point out here the scale of this painting so this is 214 by 162 millimeters or 21 by 16 centimeters where did i put my ruler So, okay, all of the markings have rubbed off. Let's get a different one. It's just worth it. So, 21 centimeters is 
that big. So it's that tall by 16 by that big. So, you know, it's basically about the size of like what a paperback novel is the original scale of this book or not this book of this painting. So it's a, it's a tiny artwork. So if while you're working on this, you feel like the details are giving you fits, just imagine working on a canvas about half the size of this. Um, so let me see. The story behind this painting, I think, is really fascinating. So, William Blake claimed to have visions that he was seeing angels and demons and dead figures, prophets, you know, uh, God, all sorts of different kinds of things that on a virtually a daily basis since his childhood. Um, partly some ex believe that was because he had, had a, I think it was a horse accident and, and hit his head. Uh, and so there's just been for, you know, a century and a half now speculation as to exactly what was going on and what, what, what is the explanation for these visions that William Blake had, or are they in fact, did he actually see what he claimed he saw? And maybe there isn't a scientific explanation at all. But uh, essentially, he claimed to be able to see all of these fantastical things. And it, all, and it also happens to coincide at a time in English history particularly, but also here in North America, where there was a great deal of interest in... Um, uh, in mediums and people who claim to be able to talk to the dead, uh, tarot card reading and Ouija boards and um, seances. In fact, today's painting, sorry, was uh, was the, the origin of it is claimed to have occurred during a seance. So, one of uh, William Blake's friends was this guy, John Varley, who was a younger fellow, was about half of his age, who was um, a student of astrology. Not astronomy, but astrology, right? Because, again, this is before science has sort of solved all things, as we may believe today. And so during... Um, so this guy was was fascinated with these visions that... William Blake claimed to have, and um, and sort of basically enlisted Blake to help him describe these uh, the things that that were claimed to have been seen at the seances that Varley had attended. Uh, so here, here's kind of part of the story: the two would often gather late at night at Varley's house and played a game in which Varley would attempt to summon the spirit of a historical or mythological person. On the appearance of the spirit, Blake would then attempt to sketch their likeness. I think that's fantastic. It reminds me of being a little kid. I remember, you know, speaking of Halloween, there were, I remember um, staying up late at night. Maybe I couldn't sleep. And I remember kind of sitting in my bed with like a little flashlight, like trying to like coax out you know, a ghost or something. I'd be like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. Come on out. If you're really there, come on out and show yourself, <laughs> you know? And so I kind of feel like this is kind of what William Blake and Varley were doing together, that they would kind of huddle together and do everything that they, they knew how to try to summon these spirits and demons uh, so that Blake could draw them. Which, you know, if you believe in these, in this other world, especially in these demons, I don't know if it's such a good idea, <laughs> you know? It seems a little bit like, um, taunt, you know, like playing with fire here, if you're so convinced that this is, that there is this other parallel dimension. Anyway, I, I just want to read this. Um, this chapter or this little bit of a quote from uh, Varley here. So in 1819, they, there was a seance that Varley held. And Varley writes, 
As I was anxious to make the most correct investigation in my power of the truth of these visions, the visions that Blake had, on hearing of this spiritual apparition of a flea, I asked Blake if he could draw for me the resemblance of what he saw. He instantly said, I see him now before me. I therefore gave him paper and pencil in which he drew the portrait. I felt convinced of his mode of proceeding, that he had a real image before him, for he left out and began on another part of the paper to make a separate drawing of the mouth of the flea, which the spirit having opened, he was prevented from proceeding with the first sketch till he had closed it. All right, so um, here's this kind of first drawing that he's making of the flea. And so what he's saying is like, I, you know, William Blake sees like Varley's trying to summon this this spirit of of a dead fly, right? And Blake says, "I see him. He's right there in front of me." And Varley's like, "What? Where? Where?" And Blake's like, G "Give me a piece of paper. Let I'm going to draw this." So he starts frantically drawing this figure, and he gets he starts drawing the mouth, and then he realizes that now the the flea has opened its mouth and it's talking and it's it's speaking in some other language. And so Blake grabs another piece of paper, draws the artwork that we're about to create here where the mouth is open, and then he f completes this drawing, and only then does the does the flea the ghost of the flea close its mouth, in which Blake is, okay, give me that other piece of paper back, because it's now closed its mouth. And I, <laughs> right? I, I, I don't know, I just think it's such a uh, theatrical almost comedic moment um, that, you know, I, it's, I mean, I, I imagine Blake must have loved hanging around Varley, you know, someone who would actually indulge him in his, in, in his visions um, rather than ridicule him, right? So I'm sure, like, Blake was more than happy to to participate in these seances with Varley because for so long people just like rolled their eyes or, or just laughed Blake or left him alone, didn't want to spend time with him. And here's somebody who claims to see similar things that Blake sees and wants him to help describe them, document these experiences. Um... So, I mean, here's another thing. Blake often said that he was joined by invisible sitters as he drew them, including, he claimed, a number of angels, Voltaire, Moses, and the flea, who told him that fleas were inhabited by the souls of such men as were by nature bloodthirsty to excess. Right, so that these ghosts of fleas, or that basically that fleas were the, the reincarnation of, of murderous humans right so that this figure here drinking this this goblet of blood you know represents you know the most nightmarish vision one could possibly ever have um what else do i want to say um so you know here's saying in in his artwork and poetry, Blake often gave personality and human form to such abstractions as time, death, plague, and famine. Fleas are often associated with uncleanliness and degradation. Um, in this work, he sought to magnify the flea into a monstrous creature whose bloodthirsty instinct was imprinted on every detail of its appearance with burning eyes which long for moisture and a face worthy of a murderer. Wow. I mean... All of, that's another reason why I love Blake. I mean, these aren't, aren't necessarily things that he wrote, but even just when you read a little bit of Blake, you almost feel compelled to use this, this very colorful visual language. Um, I will admit to, to finding Blake hard to read, um, especially trying to understand his own universe, which he had created for himself. I've never been able to wrap my head around what, how that all comes together. It's uh, extremely complex. It's it's using multiple different sources. Uh, like he's 
you know, when we did the, the portrait of Jesus for, in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, what was that, for Christmas last year? We sort of talked a little bit about this and, and about the whole story of Jerusalem that he had, had written and goes way over my head because there's like the story of Jesus, but it's also kind of a stand-in for the story of man and um, uh, human history. And it's, uh, it's definitely, again, William Blake was an eccentric person who did not fit in at all. And he really indulged his imagination in a way that I think um, made certainly made him an outcast. But I think, that, again, is one of the reasons why he's so appreciated today is just like, wow, this guy just really like uh, let his imagination r run wild. And he ran after it trying to, dis to, to document the things that he saw. Uh, so this just talks a little bit about the technique that um, uh, that he used to create this artwork and how, um, you know, it wasn't maybe the most um, uh, successful experimentation with materials, and that's why it's kind of falling apart. Uh, and then here, you know, here's the, talking about reception. During his lifetime, William Blake's prints were described as the work of a madman. Um, and then, of course, that didn't help that, you know, when word spread that he created a lot of his works through these visions that he was having. Um, here's this fellow who wrote, uh, G.E. Bentley says, So plain was Blake's madness to some that they assumed he must have been confined in a madhouse, and few were willing to believe that the artist actually saw anything. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is... I mean, what a, what a wild, bizarre figure. Let's just see. Um, okay, here's how it's framed inside the Tate Britain. Um, uh, there was, you know, so here's other people trying to explain how he created the work he did. Were they the fact, um, the product of hallucinations born of mental illness or the use of psychedelic drugs, or were they real religious visions? Um, here it says, Blake may have been inspired after seeing images of fleas from the book Micrographia by the artist, uh, by the early English scientist Robert Hooke, who produced illustrations based on his pioneering documentation of organisms as seen through the microscope. So that's another thing too, is William Blake is working kind of at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution where things are really starting to change pretty quickly and you have things like the like science is making some leaps forward. You have the kind of invention or the development of the microscope and now people can look in a microscope and see bacteria and tiny little bugs things that we couldn't see before and you know now we're sort of you know, we probably try not to think of it very much but now we're used to seeing you know that you know you see, you see photographs of like all the the organisms that are probably on our skin right now and it's like oh my goodness that's pretty creepy all these weird little creatures but we've kind of grown up with that knowledge and so it's maybe something we don't really want to think that's maybe why people like to use a lot of hand sanitizer um but you can imagine 150 years ago seeing that kind of stuff for the very first time like that is nightmare fuel if i've ever heard of it if you've if you've if you had thought that the the universe consisted of everything that we can see right now and then somebody says, hey, look through this, these little binoculars at this little um, slide plate here and tell me what you see. And you see these like weird microscopic creatures moving around and you think, oh my goodness, those are on us all that they're flying in the air. I'm inhaling them and they're in my hair and my eyes. <gasps> oh my goodness. So again, that's one explanation of how um, this work might have come about is maybe, you know, there's 
William Blake sees those kinds of things, recognizes that those things are everywhere. Maybe that's what he's talking about, of seeing these, um, these creatures all around him all the time. And maybe, maybe he literally sees them, but maybe he's meaning that more in like he's aware of them. Right, and that the body and and our environment is 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 occupied not just by us, by all sorts of other organisms, many of most of whom can't be seen with the naked human eye. Um, so here's just another thing, just before we move on, uh, just talking about how William Blake was, you know, a very active political figure. Um, but he also came about during a, a really tr tumultuous time in world history where you have, you know, all sorts of revolutionary wars happening in North America and South America. Uh, you have the Napoleonic Wars just across the channel from England with France. You have Napoleon, you know, uh, fight waging several wars and making a great big comeback. There's the... Uh, the, the the human slave trade is at its zenith um, and uh, the industrial revolution is starting right so there's just all like the 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 increasing I think there's there's probably at this period of time a sense you know uh, of uh, we talked about like artists like Pierre Bonnard and Les Nabi last episode about how they're they're they were reacting to a period of time where reason um, seemed to have solved all of humanity's problems and yet those artists were like hey let's pump the brakes I don't know if all of this change is all good and I think it's the same sort of thing just you know a hundred years before with William Blake is that there's for some people this sense of like wow things are changing and look at all the stuff we can do we can get on a train and go across the you know the, across England in in just a matter of hours a trip that would have taken you know a week to do before and isn't this exciting all the potential that we you know we can travel from london to new york in a, you know a matter of a few weeks when that you know just a generation before that was impossible like it you know it um or you the likelihood of you surviving that trip was was very very low and now people are going there for basically a vacation um, so there is that idea that things are changing for the better but there's also this sense that um, you know all of this is going a little bit too fast and are we able to keep up with the pace of change not so different than our contemporary world where a lot of people feel the same way about artificial intelligence where are we going to be in five years ten years let alone a hundred years what you know the pace of change today you know so <laughs> you can just imagine william blake coming out of his grave walking around today being just like wow okay i thought things were were tough when i was alive like wow you guys are really screwed <laughs> i'm going back to bed <laughs> wake me up in another hundred years um so um any, what else do i want to say anything else in here Um, yeah, let's, um, I think let's, let's start painting here. Let's get, let's get on with today's episode. So, uh, because we've talked extensively about William Blake's biography previously, so, uh, what I want to do now is let's just take a moment to think about if we want to add an underpainting here. So typically, well, not typically, because a lot of different artists have different definitions of an underpainting. Some artists combine the idea of an underpainting and imprimatur into one single step just by using a more opaque version of the same color, which again was often a brown, so we would do the outlines with just a darker brown or a, a, a brown that was less diluted.
Yeah, maybe it's worth doing a little bit of underpainting. So let's get a little bit of color on the palette here quickly. Wow, look at all the comments. My goodness. Oh, there's Lolly there. Awesome. I was talking about, I was watching some about um, Blake's printing process and all the equipment he used. Yeah, I mean, William Blake was, was a major innovator in, in the printing techniques. Like, really prior to William Blake, it was really difficult to reproduce artwork um, in any kind of satisfactory way. Most of the time you had to um, basically take an artwork and transform it into a line drawing to print it. And William Blake came up with a number of new techniques which allowed him to reproduce um, an artwork that kind of looked like a painting or a drawing um, that, that didn't have, that wasn't done kind of by scratching into a metal plate. And that was hugely innovative. Um, Having said that, it the method he did use was time-consuming. It did reproduce artwork relatively faithfully, but he also ended up having to do a lot of touch-ups. So he wasn't a very efficient um, artist. And yet he was, you know, we might say, well, you know, but he didn't really care about what people thought. I think he did really care. He, I think he really wanted to be, for his visions and ideas to be acknowledged, but, uh, and I think he was, he was tormented and frustrated uh, that they weren't, but he was also very stubborn. He wasn't really willing to change um, or do anything that would outside, like the, like he, he was no compromises. Like, he's like, this is the way that I'm going to work. And if it doesn't work, then it must not be my fault. It must be just the ignorance of the, of the people. So I think that also probably... I could imagine if you're a friend of William Blake's being kind of like... You know, you got... It's, I'm sure we all have a f few friends who you just... Sometimes you're just like... I'm sort of giving, I'm doing my best trying to help this guy, but man, he is just so stubborn. <laughs> um, oh, there's Randy there. Um, got my trick-or-treaters off getting their tricks and treats. Um... <laughs> well, he says Blake sounds super fun to hang out with. Um... Sandra says, I found William Blake's bio very inspiring. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, as I said, I think there's a lot for us artists to to uh, glean from the life of William Blake uh, that, I, that I think should be really inspiring. It's also perhaps even, I, I should say, maybe a bit of a cautionary tale of, um, I mean, yes, we can admire people who are, have, are unwilling to make compromises um, and have, like, have a great deal of artistic integrity but sometimes you know i don't know i would love to have recognition during my lifetime rather than a few decades later it'd be nice to be able to enjoy some of that so as much as i'm like yeah you go william i'm also just like you know you you you, you could do a few things that might get you closer to your objectives they really wouldn't be you know selling you, your you know your integrity completely you, it's okay to make a few little compromises here and there if it means reaching a broader audience but you know again history has shown us that maybe william blake knew you know he was on the right track anyway let's um i'm gonna do i want to use a black hmm 
maybe maybe I'm gonna go for a kind of a, a dark red actually where, where should I do this let's take some of our cool blue warm red this is basically how we make black we just add cool yellow to this I'm just gonna kind of stay with maybe a really dark purpley color Again, because black is just such like a, like a dead color, I always tend to kind of err on the side of wanting a little bit more life in there. And despite the fact that most of this is going to be covered up anyway, it's like, why not put a little bit of color rather than neutralize it completely with that yellow? Cleaned my brush off into a wet part of the towel. Here, let's do that again. <laughs> so, uh, let's take this small brush. So I'm not trying to do all of the lines, just some important ones. I think of these sort of like little guide posts, things to help me get back on track if I get kind of lost a little bit. I mean, because we could do all the lines. You can see like I'm kind of going for like intersection points, tips of fingers and toes. Okay, I think that's probably enough for for me. If you want to do the whole thing, that's that's certainly fine. So let's move. In fact, maybe I'm just gonna quickly blow dry that. Just because there's some of these. I deliberately kind of painted some with a little bit of ridges. So there's a little bit of texture. So as this dries, I'll be if I paint paint over top of it, I should be able to see some of those lines. <clears throat> I'm 
Driving around Palm Springs. Oh, you're making me jealous, Barbara. Oh my goodness. Or Kathy's driving around Palm Springs. Oh, it's freezing here in Vancouver at the moment. Try. I would. It might be better if you talk about Antarctica or something. That would make me feel a little bit warm. <laughs> okay, so. Let's move on to our next step, which is to get some of the color in the background. So as you know, I like to kind of do, kind of work in the background for a bit, then in the foreground, then come back to the background, then in the foreground. So I'm gonna ping pong back and forth for a little bit here. So um, let's just take a look at this painting and how we wanna do this. So when William Blake painted this, he used gold leaf for the, the curtains and part of the figure, these stars. But one of the reasons why this painting is cracking and falling apart is because he used that technique and tried to apply oil paint over, I think it was oil tempera? It's actually, let's just see. What is the material here? Yeah, tempera and gold and mahogany. So I would imagine that tempera is not gonna stick all that well to gold. So it probably was flaking off, chipping off over the years so what color are we using here and what would be the best approach i think what i want to try to do is replicate this cool blue and maybe paint it into like the, the, the shadows. So let's try some, uh, which size, let's take this cool blue. Okay, so I'm gonna take this cool blue, and I'm gonna add a little bit of matte medium to it to thin it out. I'm also just going to take a tiny bit of white. That tiny little bit of white is going to lighten the color. It's going to also help overpower a bit of the white or the yellow that's on here.
look at these side by side here. As I go. Now I'm going to take, um, I'm just going to take some glazing fluid, just get this thinner. Let's use a little bit more of this glazing fluid. So I'm just kind of trying to soften those edges out a little bit. Take this blue. Ah. It's taking up some of that, peeling that paint off. Just always get so impatient when I use glazing fluid. Uh, do I want to erase that? Maybe I do. Let's just get a bit of water.
I like that a little bit of weight coming through there too. That's okay. I wonder if it's too late to erase some of this in here. So that's not too seemly, all of that. So, but what I can do is just take my yellow from before, bring that back. Okay, it's gonna blow dry all that. So you can see I, I sort of made, I changed my mind a little bit during the middle of making that, because um, this is supposed to be this, I, I guess, some sort of like light, either it's a shooting star or it's like a stage light or something. And I kind of wanted to make that more apparent. But I really, what I wanted to just show there is that we can kind of change our mind, erase things, move things around at any point. Um, you know, does make it a little bit messy when we do stuff like that? Yeah, maybe a little bit. But it's also not the end of the world. We can make a change, put a little bit of that yellow and put mature back in place. And it's almost like nothing was actually ever there. Uh, so... Oh yeah, there's... Sorry, where are you guys talking about being somewhere in Florida? Florida's too hot for me. That's what I like to tell myself, too, is, you know what? I just, I, I don't like the heat. I, I'm, I think I need a little bit of this chilly weather to keep me humble. <laughs> but, you know, if someone wants to drag me kicking and screaming to Florida for a week, like... I guess I'd go, you know. Oh. Don't expect me to be very, be very happy about it, though. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to paint the ground down here. I'm going to make a brown. So I'm going to take my warm yellow and warm red and make an orange. And then I'm going to add blue to it. And the more blue, the darker that brown is going to be. fireworks it's the first one I've heard so far doing the same color there. What if we just make this much more thin and transparent? So you can see the difference between the brown that I use as full strength here, where I added, you know, maybe 50% or more matte medium and made it more transparent. It looks a little bit more yellow, just as if I added yellow paint in there. I mean, the, the question in my mind when I was thinking about this step is, do I want to make the paint, like, do I, do I want to preserve the imprimatur, this warm yellow, underneath all of this, and use the imprimatur as, like, a highlight? Um, in which case, that's probably what William Blake did, because this is gold leaf he's painting over, so he wants to preserve as much of that gold leaf as possible um, because what's the point of using the gold leaf if you're just going to completely cover it up with paint right um, but since I'm not actually using gold leaf I can kind of go over top of this with a brown and then paint the highlights the yellow highlights after this which is I would say probably the faster method. Okay. That's a pretty good start. Um, it's interesting, it is a little bit more greenish too. We'll get there. So maybe let's, I'm going to use the same color for this goblet. Yeah, let's let's start with the figure. Let's go to the figure next. Now that we've got the background started, let's 
do, do really quickly tackle the foreground figure, the ghost of a flea that's standing in the center of the painting. Put a little bit of color there. I don't know how much. I don't think I'm going to spend much time there. Just get that started, and then I'm going to come back to the background and ideally finish that that step. So, um, in fact, let's look at this color. I think what we want is kind of a warm reddish brown, and we're not that far off right now with this previous color. So this color here was warm yellow, warm red, and a little bit of warm blue. So I'm mostly just going to use maybe a tiny, tiny bit more warm yellow in here. Make this mostly reddish brown. So I, you can always see like when I'm working on this particular step, my, I always use like larger brushes if, if possible to try to get as much of the details painted in as quickly as humanly possible. I'm not worried about getting the right colors. I'm just generally kind of going for the the local color, as we say. The local color is the color that um, is the color of an object unmodified by by light or dark, by light or shadow. I mean. Kevin says, I never painted before the fall of 2001, ever. That's incredible. Think of all the amazing paintings you did, Kathy. That's incredible. Wow. Um, do I want to do anything more here, or can I move on? I think I'm ready to move on. Maybe I'm just going to quickly blow dry that, and then we're going to go back to the background.
Oh wow! Um, I'm sorry, I, I can't read your your name, but it um, says my first time joining in real life. I watch you from Egypt, and I learn a lot of things from you, bro. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in all the way on the other side of the world. That is so neat. That's so great. Thank you, my brother. Great to see you in the in the chat there. Okay. So let's uh, let's go back to the background here. So now we've got paint all over the entire painting in the foreground, middle ground, background, all of it's got paint somewhere. And actually, I, I, I gotta say, I kind of like the painting like this. It's very, I mean, obviously there's, you have a long ways to go, but these bright saturated colors clashing like that is kind of nice. Like I'm, I was trying to think of like who it reminds me, there's like a David Hockney-ish kind of quality going on here. I don't think you ever painted any nightmarish characters like this. Um, although there's still time. He's, David Hockney's still around. But those that particular kind of bright blue and yellows and reds are really iconic Hockney colors. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's go to the the thing the furthest in the background, which is the 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 dark. Um, like it looks like he's on a stage set or something, or is this like a window? These curtains, you know, are very stage-like. They could be on a window. Uh, maybe that's what these stars are. Maybe, yeah, maybe it's a windowsill or something that this little flea's on. But it looks, at, at the same time, it, it, it looks like a large, like, I mean, I think that's probably part of the painting is this ambiguity between is this a tiny little fly or is this a human-sized creature? And I think... Um, I don't know how intentional that would have been with Blake to kind of confuse or conflate those two things together. But, uh, you know, generally when we see a humanoid form, we tend to imagine that it's going to be human in scale as well. Um, but uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's get some black, put that in there, fade it out a little bit into... Okay, so you'll recall that previously we started making this kind of purpley color, and that was using, let's make a bit more cool blue, warm red, and this time I'm actually going to use some cool yellow. So put it all here, let's spin it all together. I hear from people all the time telling me that mixing their own black is the most difficult thing to do. And I, I hear you, but it also comes with like a little bit of experience. The more you do, the easier it's going to become. I just... I, uh, the, the easiest thing to think about is you're always adding... So if the color is a little bit too much in one direction or the other, just add the opposite color on the color wheel. So if it looks a little bit purple, what's the opposite color of purple on the color wheel? Yellow. Right, so if it's a little bit purpley, we add more cool yellow. If it's a little bit greenish, because we use cool blue and cool yellow to make our green, then we need to add more red. If it looks a little bit reddish, we need a little bit more green. If it looks a little bit brown or yellowish, we need to add a little bit more blue. So I know easier said than done. And, you know, I, I don't really, it's been a long time since I learned this technique, but I'm probably sure I had just as many, you know, uh, moments of confusion as someone just learning how to mix their own black. The thing, if you're ever just like completely lost and you just can't tell, because it can be hard to identify a color when it's black like that, and to be able to... Anyway, just take a little bit of white and mix that white to the side. And you know, it instantly when I do that, I'm like, oh, that looks a little bit on the purpley side. So, 
I don't want to use the same brush that I just used to mix the white, so um, now I'm going to take a little bit more of this yellow and bring that in. Because if it's purple, what do I need on the opposite side is some yellow. So I bring a little bit of that yellow in here. And that already is feeling just a little less purple, a little bit more black. I still think it's going to be a little bit more on the purpley side. Let's take a little bit more yellow. You know, obviously what can happen is you end up kind of just bouncing back and forth because, oh, now it's too much yellow. So now it's starting to look a little greenish. Ah, okay, now i got to put a little more red in there. Ah, too much red. Now it's looking a little bit orange. And at some point I usually just like, I don't give up, I just like, I'm just gonna move on. I'm just gonna use what the color I've got there and it's gonna be okay. So. Which, where should I start here? I'm gonna start by doing a little bit of glazing with this black. One thing I often notice is when I clean my brush and I'm moving kind of quickly, I notice water will kind of build up on the brush and then as I start to paint, all that water rushes right out onto the painting and creates a little puddle. So that's why sometimes you see me just brushing my brush on my hand it's somewhat sometimes just to get some of that water off or just because I can immediately feel if it's wet just by rubbing it against my hand so sometimes you might see me just quickly doing that and if I go like oh that's really wet okay I need to use the rag sometimes just brushing on my hand will get some whatever excess paint is off okay so I put some glazing fluid here matte glazing fluid and now let's take a little bit of black mix it into here So I'm using this glazing food just to make a thin coat of paint over top of this here, just to darken it down a little bit. I'm just going to blow dry that.
Okay, now I'm going to take my black. So that black really adds something very dynamic to this artwork. I love it. Because after all, like contrast is as I say all the time, is so important to paintings. And getting a little bit of contrast really kind of helps create depth. I know the space between his legs here is a little bit lighter. I'm in fact just going to darken that just for my consistency on, on my side, but uh,
feels great. So I like that there's a little bit of blue coming through this black. And if I was to, I think I'm happy at the moment with the level of darkness of that black. But if I was to kind of wanted to, to darken it down a little bit more, I'd probably go out of my way to add a little bit of, um, of a little bit more blue into that mixture to make it, uh, Uh, so it doesn't just get pure black, like it's got something in there. Just trying to add a bit of glazing fluid to soften the border between that dark and the highlight. Barbara says, I love mixing black. I was so satisfying to achieve that. Uh, I added different skin tones down the sides of my color wheel. It's so cool to make so many different shades. Very smart. Very, very smart. JM says, I feel like my cool blue might have a bit of white or something in it. My black always looks a little bit gray and not nice and deep. That's entirely possible. What, what brand of um, paint are you using, JM? I'd be interested to know... Um, just so I can kind of track that, especially if it's one that I'm recommending, uh, a different brand. Barbara says, I just bought the Amsterdam Cyan today. I found the same problem with other brands, JM. Uh, Clancy says, random aside, but your stream quality is amazing. <laughs> and Chris Smith, or Chris Smythe says, for real. I just finished the first episode of a series on drawing for beginners. It was tons of fun, and the quality is great. <laughs> just, just keep in mind, there, there that quality does go up and down a few times <laughs> over the course of that drawing course. Um, um, it, just remember that that was recorded in the first like few weeks of the pandemic, and I only had access to what I could access, and. Uh, so, and just figuring out the equipment, sometimes it was a little bit louder or, or not working at all. So, that's the nature of doing something live, I guess, right? But I do appreciate the compliment, and I can't take <laughs> credit for the technology that I have here, but um, that's, uh, it does, that's also why a lot a lot of my money goes towards uh the, the, the my internet provider so thank you to all those of you who do donate on occasion that helps pay the the bills that help get this feed out into the world so i again thank you to all those of you who continue to support the channel the big brainer says i just started on the drawing beginners course it's very fun i'm already addicted and i'm on episode three now awesome cool um you know, I since uh, three of you are just talking about doing the drawing course, one of the things, the first few episodes have like 500,000 views or some crazy thing, and then it kind of starts to tail off. If at some point, you know, I be, I'm always curious, is like, what is it about those episodes that are causing people maybe not to finish the program? I mean, certainly there's tens of thousands of people that did, but I just, I'm always curious, is like, oh, why... There's at some point, I don't know, maybe it's the audio quality. People are like, oh, is there going to be this terrible for the rest of the, of the series or not? One day I'm going to redo all those episodes. So 
I'm always interested in getting some feedback. Um, just like I like giving people feedback, I like receiving some feedback. Constructive criticism is always uh, appreciated. So, um, uh, okay. So, uh, what was I going to do? Let's move on to the curtains here. Um, so, put this in the water. How do I want to approach this? I think I want to do... It is a little bit tricky when we've got such large swaths of paint that I want to blend. It's much easier to do this with oil paint, but we're painting with acrylic, and because it dries so fast, that can kind of give us some fits. In fact, now that I'm looking at this, I'm thinking maybe putting a little bit of green in here might be a good idea. Giving it actually a little bit of a greenish wash. So, um, I was just about to start darkening and it's like, you know what? I'm gonna, let's do a green wash over top of this brown. Let's take yellow, a little bit of red. That looks good. And I'm just gonna put a lot of medium in here. So now I'm making it way transparent. Way transparent, dude. Super transparent. <laughs> Way transparent, okay. I just love using mediums and and being able to to modify the painting like this um, and not completely change the painting just sort of add a little bit more green and you know if I was just to paint that green directly over top of this well now I have solid green curtains and nothing against solid green curtains I'm probably going to get a lighter, uh, a letter from uh, Solid Green Curtains International. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just want to change the color a little bit. You don't want to kind of make a radical change. You just want to change a little bit. Instead of trying to get the color exactly right and mix it and paint it, using mediums like matte medium or glazing fluid, allow me just to to make that small subtle change without making you know major global change to the whole painting that um, can be almost a little bit too much so that gets me a little bit closer to the to you know, still have the brown coming through but now there's it's got a little bit of a greenish quality And I think, you know, a lot of painters, they love that, that, um, this precise thing where you look at it and you're like, is that brown or is that green? It's kind of a greenish brown, but I see both simultaneously. How do I mix that color? And in reality, to do that, you can't just mix that one color and paint it. I mean, you can try... But instead, doing what we're doing is layering multiple colors on top of one another. And then you get these weird effects where you see multiple colors simultaneously. Uh, it's sort of like taking two flashlights and, and projecting them, two different colored flashlights, like a red 
and a blue at the wall you, both lights are there and they're making purple but it's it's not just a purple light it's a combination of multiple lights and so that there's just that extra complexity that is i think super satisfying as a viewer i want to blow dry that Uh, a little investigation. So Jam says, I'm using the Liquitex Brilliant Blue. So, what, uh, where's my... Um, so these are the colors that I recommend for blue. Uh, Cerulean Blue for, if you're using Liquitex, for your cool blue and ultramarine blue for your warm blue. Um, so those, in almost every case, cerulean blue is the is a, your is a really good cool blue, um, or cyan blue um, would be similar. Cyan, cerulean are very similar. They're very, uh, they're they're basically blue right before blue s turns into green, right? So I'm always whenever I'm when I'm choosing these colors. Like the six colors that I'm, I want to use for my um, uh, my color wheel. I'm I'm trying to find the two like let's say the two yellows, yellows that are the furthest away from one another as possible before they turn into let's say in this case a green or in this case into an orange. I mean even the warm yellow is verging on orange already. It's like it almost appears to be basically an orange or like a very subtle orange. Same thing with the cool yellow. It's like, it's super saturated and bright, but we don't have to add much blue at all before it instantly turns into a green, right? Same thing with these blues. In reality, they're, they're actually quite far away from one another on the color wheel, which enables me to mix the colors, that the blues that are in between. So for instance, probably the most well-known blue that would exist between this uh, cerulean blue and ultramarine blue would be cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is I mean, maybe about as close as you can get to a primary color. It's very lukewarm, as you say. So if you were to try to use uh, a cobalt blue instead of in here, you would you would notice that you, you're not going to be able to get the saturated colors by mixing them together. Same thing with the reds. Many times I've bought, well not many times, but a few times I've bought uh, cool reds that aren't quite cool enough that because our cool red what we really want is a magenta and magenta is is you know got one foot into purple already right it makes a bright hot pink even though it's cool but it's um it's almost a purple magenta right where your warm red is more like your fire engine red right it's a, like a fiery red color so Whenever you're you're looking at them, try to find two two yellows or two reds, two blues that are very far away from one another, right before that color. Let's say the cool blue turns into a green, or the warm blue turns into a purple, the cool yellow turns into a green, or the warm yellow really gets very orangey, so on and so forth. If that makes sense. Barbara says, I had never drawn before February 2023. I completed the drawing course a couple weeks ago. I sketch every day still. It's a big part of my life. Thank you, Barbara. That's so good. That is awesome. Wow, you're an all-star. I love hearing stories like that where people are, you know, diving into something like a new creative um, uh, uh, genre, creative tool, creative mode of expression whether that be painting or drawing or violin or dance or poetry or whatever it is, as I say all the time, I think the world would be a much better place if everyone had a creative outlet, a way of expressing their thoughts and feelings 
as opposed to um, violence or you know uh, drugs, alcohol, things that um, uh, which are just totally non-productive. Whereas literally when you're making art, you're being productive, you're creating things, you're adding value to the world. So hearing you go on that, I mean, obviously, Barbara, you've been a great painter for all these this time, but then exploring drawing and that you're making that a big part of your life now, that makes me so excited. Okay. Um... Where am I here? Oh yeah, let's uh, paint, finish these curtains. Uh, okay. So what was I was gonna do some glazing? I'm just trying to remember what I'm up to. <laughs> uh, so what I want to do is I want to just start kind of darkening these areas down. So to do that, I'm using my glazing fluid. And I'm adding black into the glazing fluid. The great thing with the difference between glazing fluid and matte medium, I should just quickly say, I know I've, I've mentioned this hundreds of times before, but not everybody's watching for the first time and not everybody, um, or not everybody is watching for the hundredth time. Um, but the main difference between a, a matte medium and a glazing fluid is both of them are, are gonna dry transparent both of them make colors that they're added to more transparent, but glazing fluid has a chemical in there that slows the drying time down. In fact, I almost feel like matte medium, it almost behaves as if there's the opposite, a chemical that speeds up the drying time. I don't think so, but that's just how it always seems to me. Uh, but glazing fluid slows the drying time down, so that way I can blend the color out. Or, if worse comes to worse, I can wipe it away because it takes a little bit longer to dry. Uh, so, So to do you know something like this effectively it's going to take a little bit of patience because i want to build up layers of this And this outside edge, I'm going to do that too because I kind of want that to fade out. So I'm probably going to have to do that like two or three times to get the look that I'm after here. And then also I'm going to go back over and lighten it up eventually or the the brighter areas with a little bit more of a gold kind of quality
might as well start to put some shadow here. Okay, so let's blow dry this. That's interesting, James saying, sorry, I'm a little bit behind on the stream. This is very useful. Let's see if I could find a different color and give that a try. I've always wondered, you know, when people tune in a little bit late and they start from the beginning and they leave comments, do they show up at this, like in real time or they must, right? Because um, I know not everyone is necessarily watching the video in real time. Sometimes people want to watch it from the beginning and even though I'm live they're watching from the start so I know this is a bit of a time-consuming process, but, and ideally we would do this many, many times. And the more times I do it, the more effective, believable these curtains will appear. But at some point, I'm going to, some point coming up soon, I might uh, try to speed this process up, which makes, maybe not going to make it as quick quite as effective, but...
Let's see. Try that. So I know this is kind of a little bit tedious uh, to to do, or maybe even especially to watch, but the it's the really the secret to kind of building up that this effective illusion of depth here, and so it takes some time. And what's happening is the paint is sort of building up in strength, and that the softer edges kind of appearing to kind of create the little. The, the indentations, the weave, the texture of this, these curtains. And as I go, I might use just a little bit more um, black paint in here, just to make it a little bit stronger. Mostly just out of impatience. <laughs> Uh, because I gotta, you know, move on here. I don't want to spend. Uh, sometimes I spend way too much time on my backgrounds. The other thing too is you want to do this in real time. You don't want to just do a bunch of the stripes and then try to blend them because what will happen is the paint will have kind of seized up by the time you get to it. And then you can't blend it anymore. So as much as it does give you that extra minute or so to blend, you you got to be on it. You can't just... So that's why I try to do, you know, small areas at a time, working in a larger, like these big stripes, I have to be, kind of get like a, a routine down here to, it's like a little assembly line. 
got both my paintbrushes in my hand. So that's starting to, to look pretty good. It actually reminds me a lot of William Blake's work thus far. So this m might be the last set of these stripes that I do, like this anyway. And then I'm contemplating doing um, a larger dark layer over top, just to, especially on the edges, just to darken the frame in a little bit, give it a bit of more of a vignette kind of quality. I should have just blow dry that. See, I'm wiping that paint off. Bumped the canvas with the hair dryer.
Okay, let's um. Well, let's just compare it to the original here. I do feel like it might be nice just to darken just this little bit, this edge of the curtains on the sides. Um, so, did I blow dry all of that? I think I did, right? Take my brush, try to get as much moisture off there as possible. Let's take this glazing fluid. It's very subtle, but just darkened those outer edges down by like, you know, um, 30% or so. And I may even want to do that a little bit more. So that's good enough. Do I want to do the highlights now? I might, I think I might as well put some highlights in now. So, or do I want to, does that need to be darkened even more? It could get darker, but I think that's okay. I think it's okay. So, let's, um, So, uh, Barbara says, I've got to say good night. Uh, this is a great painting so far. I love it. Thanks, Barbara. Time for some sleep. Yes. Good to see you, Barbara. Have a wonderful evening. Sweet dreams. Don't let the ghost fleas bite. <laughs> Think of I'm also just right now cleaning my blending brush that I used because you know you want to make sure that you don't let that just sit with paint for too long because it's going to ruin the brush, right? So that paint, I've been taking wet paint and smearing it, and, and 
it's starting to get a little bit crusty, which is first of all going to create little scratches instead of nice soft blending. But then if I leave it there, it's going to, the, the, the paint's going to dry and the brush is going to be ruined, right? So, you know, after a little while, you want to make sure you clean that brush off. Okay, I'm going to blow dry that. So now I want to go the opposite way here. I want to take some, uh, where, where should we mix this? Let's take a, this bigger brush. Let's take some white and warm yellow. It's mostly warm yellow. Mix this in here. So I'm going to go the opposite direction. Let's just clean this brush off there. So I've got my glazing fluid here and this paint that I just mixed up, which has a lot of white in it. So I just have to be careful because that white is pretty dominant and it's going to make a big change pretty quickly, very easily. So I want to keep that white to a minimum if I can. I'm, I, I might have added a little bit too much here. Worst comes to worst, I've got the glazing fluid in there. I could erase it if I make a mistake or I'm not happy with it. I'm also trying to speed things up, keep this train running. So sometimes I do maybe move a little bit faster than, than even I want to. Um, let's get a nice new dry blending brush.
big head in the way. The only thing I remember from the movie So I Married an Axe Murder, um, starring um, Mike Myers, not the 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 horror movie from character from Halloween, but the comedian Mike Myers. There's a scene where he's playing like a his like old uncle or grandfather or something Scottish uncle who gets angry at the the young version of Mike Myers and is like head head get out of the way of the TV you big head just calls the kid head so that's what I think about every time I get my head in the way of the camera head I feel like yelling at myself <laughs> uh, Chase says, is that the devil or something? Also, hello. <laughs> Hi, Chase. Um, so this is called the the ghost of a flea, and this is some sort of um, nightmarish vision that the artist claimed to have had during the middle of a seance. They tried to con him and a friend tried to conjure up a a, 
a beast or demon of some kind from the spiritual realm. And this is what um, William Blake claimed to have seen when, when they asked for something to appear from the other side. And the, the funniest thing about it is that it uh, was nice enough to pose for William Blake. It stood there, and William Blake carefully sketched it out for us to see, and this is the result. It could look like his father. I, I, I don't know what uh, William Blake's father looked like. Okay, I'm almost ready to move on. I mean, I, I, this, I really love doing this kind of stuff because it really adds depth to a painting and it's very satisfying seeing, you know, these highlights come in and, and really the secret to creating depth in a painting is contrast between light and dark. So the more of this we do, the more believable this space will become. I do feel like I could darken the darks again, but maybe it's I should consider moving on. The only areas where I really feel like I need, kind of need to make it work now as opposed to later is, for instance, where it's going to cross over his body here. And that's obviously so much easier to do now then because I'm gonna paint over this area and fix that area so it's always easier to, to make those changes before So maybe I am just going to quickly do a little bit of Taking my glazing fluid and my black again.
Okay, I think that's good enough. Let's move on here. I think um, we can do the stars and stuff maybe as a final touch. Clancy says, it's his dad. I love that movie. It was surprisingly good and I haven't met too many people who've seen it. Sorry, what... What movie are you talking about, Clancy? It's his dad. Is it the devil or something? It's his dad. What, what movie are you talking about? I, did you say something earlier, Clancy, that... His dad. You mean William Blake's dad? What, sorry. Okay, I'm just going to quickly blow dry this so that I can move. So I married an axe murderer. Ah, it's his dad. Okay. <laughs> I get you. Thank you for clarifying that. I was like, what? That's dad. Okay. When I was talking about head, head, get out of the way, head. Okay. <laughs> now, I went back. So now we're talking about foreground number two, right? Now that we've got the background mostly finished, there's still a few things like the stars that I want to put back there. Let's go and work on the figure itself, the ghost of a flea. And I'm pretty happy with the way everything looks thus far. The, the curtains, you know, I spent a good hour, hour and a half on those curtains. Had I been painting with oil paint, I probably could have done them faster. But to get that same sort of a soft transition between different colors in acrylic paint. It requires uh, either painting with a lot of paint um, or using glazing fluid in order to blend it out. You could do it with a lot of paint, but you have to be kind of quick. And that it takes, I mean, that's essentially, in a way, that's what Bob Ross's technique is to use. A, a, and obviously he's painting with oil paint, but to you can kind of mimic that with acrylic paint by painting on wet paint and you're painting with that way you can kind of blend those things together anyway long story short let's move on um so with our figure where should we start here we've got our local color this red that's underneath everything uh i think it'd probably be helpful to, to go darker and start to darken in the figure and then because that way we can see where some of the muscles and, and you know where the arm ends etc um so i'm gonna go down to a smaller brush and Just looking here, trying to see about the the shadows. Do I does he use any color? It's almost like there's a little bit more blue in the shadow. So in my mind, I'm thinking maybe I'll do a little bit of like purple in the shadows, which is a little bit more of an impressionist technique. Obviously, the impressionists are 
like 50, 40 years after this painting would have been, I don't know, 50, what, 1860, yeah. Um, so 30 to 40 years after this painting was made, or, in a, or at least after William Blake dies, um, so to do that, let's take our warm red. Actually, let's take our cool red. Do we want to get something that saturated? Maybe, maybe let's, let's try it. You know, I like my bright colors, so. Let's t so by taking the cool red, I'm going to get an even brighter purple. And you know, when I look at this image, yes, it's kind of degraded and it's pixelated because of, I've enlarged it from a smaller image. Um, uh, and so it's hard to decide, determine, you know, is some of those kind of very vibrant colors that we see in the black, darker areas, is that just you know, um, fragments from the JPEG compression, or is that stuff really there? Hard to know. I, I, I think it's probably more, um, uh, like digital noise that's appearing there as opposed to him painting with purple. That would have been I don't even know if anyone would have used that particular technique at the time. Oh, I'm like, where is, where is my paintbrush? Oh, you mean the one sitting right in the middle of your painting? Yeah. Oh yeah, that one, Michael. Um, I'm also just going to add a tiny bit of glazing fluid to my purple here to make it a little bit more transparent. And if I do want to kind of smudge or blend it out, I have that option. So I, you know, I'll admit to, you know, when it push comes to shove, I'm a little bit more um, inclined to follow the impressionist technique, which is to use opposite colors, uh, darker opposite colors in the shadows. So like when you have a red, you know, putting in like blue, purple into the, into the shadows. Uh, as opposed to just putting black, which is what I'm sure William Blake would have done, all of his contemporaries would have done. It's not really till the Impressionists that you start having um, a different type of approach to color theory. So let's get these side by side. So you can see the kind of conundrum I'm faced with, like, what is this circular thing there? Is that the bottom of like a chalice, like a, you know, grail cup? Or is that like a fingernail that's particularly long and wrapping around there? I don't know. Also, just going to bring my outline and have that kind of nearby off to the side here so that I can refer to that. Sometimes I find that because I already I did this outline in preparation for this, so I'm, I was already kind of spent time kind of examining this picture, trying to see if I could kind of uh, figure out some of these details.
so there was that little gap of between the paint there and you know technically what I just did was wrong but I wanted to it's easier for me to fill that area in with that purple rather than try to remix the color that w was there Imagine seeing that in your nightmares. I bet that would be pretty scary. Uh, says Chase. Chase says, oh, that's so freaky looking. Clancy says, I do that technique because I used to live in a very arid environment. So I had to move quick. Now I live in a humid environment and I have to sort of slow down a bit. I'm not complaining though. Oh man, yeah, what is that? I hate when I can only find low-res images of famous artist paintings because they exist still why is the quality so bad so generally the quality you know um the museums want you to go there you know spend money and admission and buy a postcard or a poster while you're there so they um they try to to limit the the quality of images that are out in circulation so that there's a, you're motivated to to go to the museum. Um, most of the artwork that we look at on this show is in the public domain. One way that museums can kind of get around um, the public domain is by re-photographing the work and then copywriting the photograph, the new photograph. So it's not the artwork itself that is under copyright, but the photographer's photograph of the work that's in the public domain um, so some museums are are more amenable to having their images uh, their artworks in their collection um, available for everyone on the internet Generally, some of the large, like, national galleries and things tend to be more open to that because technically they're, you know, they're owned by the people of whatever country. And so to withhold the images from, from the people seems like anti-democratic, right? So I will say most of the paintings we do, except for a small number, tend to be in major museums uh, that, are, that are public museums as opposed to like private collections. I sometimes, I'll do p pieces that are in private collections and, um, you know, some of the more expensive paintings as part of that series that I've done do tend to be 
you know, uh, privately owned. I've never had someone contact me, ask me to take the video down or sue me. Or, um, mostly because paint, doing this in an educational context allows me a lot of leeway to... There's protections for using anything if, there, if it's for educational purposes, so... But I'm always surprised at sometimes how difficult it is to find good quality images of famous artworks. And so that's why sometimes the reference material that we use is it's as good as I can get it. And sometimes you know, I use the library a lot. I find books in the library and, and use those. So these kind of outlines are not necessarily something you want to do with all artworks. Um, a lot of artists went out of their way to not do outlines. Um, in fact, I remember when I was in art school, I had teachers that would give me a lot of grief, or I gave them a lot of grief, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, for using, for always outlining things. And sort of the, my own personal reasoning for, I think, doing that was um, when I was younger, I used to, and still to this day, read comic books. And at least back in the day, all comic books featured a lot of outlining because of the limitations of of the printing press. Now, comic book printing is way more sophisticated. In the 90s and early aughts, uh, printing techniques, they were there. They had been there for a little while, but the price came way down, and you could, you could print a really high-quality, digitally um, colored comic for you know five or six bucks whereas previously it, it, it just was cost prohibitive no one could afford to buy you know like a fifty dollar comic book or something Oops, sorry. Moved way up the body here. So a lot of this area back here is pretty hard to see. all very very dark
So now that I've done a bit of those outlines, I'm just uh, going around and um, using a larger brush just to put in some big shadowy areas. Okay, let's just zoom back out here. So I'm just going to continue for a moment here, darkening the darker areas. So just like doing the curtains, <clears throat> we're just going back again and again over some of the same areas in order to darken them down. I feel like I need to tackle that chalice <coughs> now. I've kind of been putting that off. Partly because I have no idea what that is. I mean, it looks like some sort of cup, but what's going on under there? I, it's, I don't understand. Um, uh, 
Clancy says, I'm a... I'm a little weird, maybe, and that shouldn't... I'm a little weird, maybe, and that shouldn't be like that. I think we should be able to see the depth of it. I can't just pick up and go to said museum. I think there are many people like me that can't. For sure. For sure. Um, I mean, I, I understand why museums are protective of their work. I do, th I do think that... You know, I'm always surprised when some museums won't let you take photographs in there. And I, I think to myself, <coughs> okay, well, if you won't let me take a photograph in there, then you should have every single artwork that you have on display as postcards in the gift shop. I'm, I'm, I love buying postcards. I love I, my studio. I often have like postcards all over the walls of places I've been to as, as um, reference material, inspiration. What drives me crazy is when they won't let you take a photograph and they don't have a postcard. So it's like, it kind of pushes people to maybe take an illicit photograph in the museum as opposed to just buying maybe a high quality one. I, I'm happy paying two, three dollars for a really nice postcard. I, yeah, don't get me started, it drives me crazy. Um, says, not to rant, but it gets my goat. I just love art is all. Comics were what got me into art, so I will always be my first love. My first comic I ever read was The Death of Superman. My tiny brain was blown away by it. Oh, well. my painting is coming along so nicely. I have to catch some Z's, but I'll be finishing this live stream. It was nice to chat and cram in some of my own painting time along with you. Awesome. Thank you, Clancy. Thanks for keeping me company. That's great. Well, get a good night's sleep. Happy Halloween. Hopefully this creature doesn't keep you up late at night tonight. And we'll see you again. Awesome. Okay, so our chalice here. Let's just take a look. I mean, the color is similar to the body. Uh, it's a little bit of kind of that brownish, orangey color. I think I might... Well, I was just going to say make it more orange, but I think I'm going to use some orange highlights on the body so in an ideal world i would make this different i'm contemplating some sort maybe blue oops yeah like you'd see like that's my interpretation of what you see is that what you see there do you see a ring in the finger on the other side probably not but I thought, well, let's just see. Could that be a blue cup? Just because trying to do this in, in orange is going to be tricky. I always just like kind of creating a bit more contrast. But does that make it totally outside of the original? Paint it warm blue, so it stands. Let's let's go off on a limb and paint this warm blue. We can always make a change if we're not happy with it. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a little bit of white here. This might be too extreme. We'll see. I'm going to paint this a little bit lighter just to overcome some of that yellow. Everything's pretty sticky here. Um, I don't know too much about this, the provenance of this. There is, I think in the Wikipedia article there was something about that, how this painting ended up 
where it is now in the, in the, the collection of the Tate Britain in, in, in London. Like, I sort of imagine <laughs> um, that William Blake painted this painting, and then, you know, him and Varley went around telling people, hey, look, this is what we saw the other day. We saw this thing. And people are like, oh, really? Hmm. So, sorry, how much did you guys have to drink when that happened? I'm like, no, you don't understand. We saw this ghost of a flea. It's terrifying. Hmm. I bet. Yeah, it looks very scary. And so how did you make this drawing? Well, you know, I, I've i got my sketchbook out and I made a quick couple of sketches while it was standing there. It, it was nice enough to pose for me. Oh, so this monster you know, stopped what it was doing, stopped terrifying people and decided it was going to pose for you. Oh, interesting, William. Hmm. Yeah, I'm sure it's exactly what happened. Meanwhile, if t <coughs> later tonight or next week no stream happens, you, you may want to... Uh, it might be possible that I was in fact the victim of a vengeful flea, or, or ghost of a flea, I should say. Okay, so that's very, very light, very bright. Obviously, it was way too intense for the. But what I I painted that with white in there, so that I could paint something over top of it, and it would show up relatively well. So I'm just gonna blow dry this quickly. Now I'm going to take my blue. In fact, I'm probably going to add a little bit of this purple in here just to darken it down. I just sorry, I just took my the purple I made using my cool blue and or cool red and warm blue, just adding it to this. Just it's going to make this blue just a little bit darker. So maybe even
I was hoping to be done this painting in time tonight to be able to go see a cheap movie here in Canada. You, uh, many places have cheap films at movie, at movie theaters on Tuesdays. Two movies that I want to see that are currently out are Killers of the Flower Moon and The Creator, which I don't really know much about, but apparently it's supposed to be okay, and um, it's a big Hollywood action movie, but one of the reasons I want to see it is uh, it's not based on um, a Marvel thing or anything, and I always want to try to encourage directors to make more original films. Or not directors, well, directors, but studios to take a chance on more unique things. So even now, if I decided I wanted to turn this into a bit more of an orange, I could glaze like brown and orange over top of that. And because there's blue under there, it's going to look very different. It, I might even use the exact same. In fact, maybe I'll do that. I, that could be, maybe that's worth doing for some people. I, I don't know. Let me think about it. I'm going to take this same color, it's a little bit more on the blue side, and bring it back into these shadows again. Arrogant just kind of stunned me there for a second.
I think I might be ready to go the opposite direction to start adding some highlights. I think, right? I mean, I do have to, I mean, ideally his back kind of just blends right out into the, you can see how it just sort of disappears. Like where is his, the, the back of his body there? I mean, maybe I have made him wider there. It's hard to, it's so hard to tell there. So do I want to just blend that out into the black? I don't know, let's blow dry and think about it. Okay, so if you recall, a while ago I was using some of this warm yellow and white to do some of the stuff on the curtains. So I think I'm going to go back to that. Let's just see if this color still, um, it's that glazing fluid, so it's kept it nice and wet. You know, if I start kind of glazing this yellow over top of this blue, it's starting to kind of go a little bit gray and brown. So that's cool. So it's no longer so intense. I'm gonna, I want to do a little bit more here. In fact, maybe, uh, well, let's just let that dry and work on highlights elsewhere on the figure. Let's go to a smaller brush here. Maybe just get a little bit more paint on here and speed this process up. Thank you. 
Oh, actually, let's get a little bit of the muscles on his back here. Not sure where that light is coming, but maybe is it from that star? I don't know. So where is that light coming from? I mean, obviously, the <laughs> this is from his imagination. Well, I guess he claims that he saw this, but um, um, notice that the lighting is not particularly consistent it's a little bit all over the place and that's typical when you're drawing something from your imagination it's hard that's that's why artists like to use models for uh, reference because then you have something to um, To check your work against and to consult for accuracy. And when you don't have that, that can be pretty tricky.
<clears throat> anyway, if anyone's seen either uh, Killers of the Flower Moon or The Creator, I'd love to hear your your feedback. Which one you would choose? <clears throat> okay, maybe while I got this paint on my palette, let's paint some of those stars.
Now there is a star, oddly enough, on the curtain. I might take that off, just because it's... I don't, I don't understand the logic of that. Um, and also, I just like how I've done the curtain right there, and I'm just like... You know what? I'm just going to not paint the star there because I kind of like how I've done the curtain in that area. Okay, so let's back back out. Ooh, that's starting to look pretty good. If I don't, if I do say so myself. <laughs> okay, let's blow dry that. There's Kathy says, I just finished trick-or-treating. I'm back. I just watched Jeopardy. And one of the questions was, nude descending, dot, dot, dot. So I got one answer. Staircase. The answer is staircase. <laughs> Our painting from last month. Too funny. Uh, Kathy says, great job, Michael. And Lolly says, looking great. Thank you, guys, for your support. I appreciate that. Um, getting there. Getting there. Um, I mean, I... I Honestly, I feel like I could probably walk away right now, but I think there's some things that I want to do. Um, I uh, I feel compelled. Like I think the the this goblet needs a little work. Obviously, I'm missing an eye. Little things like that, and I I am compelled to really darken this area back here down, um, and maybe even just take the black and try to make a transition from one to the other. Possibly. Also, I mean, technically there's supposed to be blood in here, so part of me wants to kind of maybe have a little bit of blood sloshing around inside that cup. Um, also, you know, the way that I've done his... He looks... The way that he did this is he, his forehead just ran right into his nose. Let's...
put a bit more white into these flowers. Or not flowers. Into the, especially this star here. bit of a crossroads as to how much more work I want to put in on this I mean I feel like I'm pretty close I mean I could just wrap it up in five minutes here put like some toenails on here and eyeball call it a day I think I want to clean up this. Okay, so let's make a brown. In fact, let's just split this into another. I'm, I'm pretty close. I feel like I could stop right now, but I think I want to just do a little bit more. I want to add a little uh, these the planks of wood on the floorboards here, or windowsill, or stage, or however you want to imagine that. Uh, and then I want to darken my background and just clean up some of these lines around the fingernails, etc. Um, but getting pretty close here. So let's mix a brown. So we'll take our warm yellow, mostly warm yellow, a little bit of warm red, and a little bit of warm blue. Mix these guys together. darker brown. Let's take that same color, mostly red. Now we got a much darker brown. Because I might use that for the chalice here, we'll see. Emerson says, Happy Halloween, everyone, and, oh, uh, oh, because Kathy said, Jamie, if you're still here, maybe add more blues, I find, add more blue, and it gets darker, or more black, Emerson says, Happy Halloween, Lolly says, Happy Halloween to everyone, and Kathy says, look at the detail in the body tone, body muscle tone, great job, Michael. And Lolly says, yeah, Kathy, but our clock just went back, so I guess it's not as late as usual, and I meant to be getting some sleep tonight. It's terrible, or Michael is a bad influence on me. It's 11 p.m. where Emerson is. 3, 11 a.m., Lolly. Oh, my goodness. Get to sleep. Oh, my goodness. Hope you don't have to work at 8 or something in the morning. Lolly says, I'll never know how you can create a piece like this in a few short hours, Michael. I could never do this all in one go. My hands and eyes would drop off. And mentally, I'd lose the plot. You're awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Um, Kathy says, I agree, Lolly. I have to paint in stages. Um, 
Uh, Lolly says, yeah, if I paint her for four to five hours straight, there's no way I'd look anyway half decent. Takes a lot of control and commitment to stay on track for after three plus hours. Uh, to yeah, to a certain extent, I yeah, I, um, I always, I've always just felt like once I get into the mode of painting, I want to stay painting. Um. Believe it or not, I can definitely, I'm really good at procrastinating. <laughs> so it's sort of like, because I often think to myself like, uh, oh, do I really want to paint? Ooh, uh, so much work. And, and yet the minute I start painting, I'm like, I love this. Oh, why am I not doing this with every second of my life? Uh, and then as soon as it's done, like, oh, thank goodness, oh, I don't know when, oh, I don't want to do that again. It's going to be a while. And then so part of doing these live streams, having like a weekly thing where I'm going to do this, uh, has been really good for, for my overall practice as an artist, giving me a routine. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, sometimes it's really hard. So yeah, once I'm in the mode, like I could paint all night long, and some of you <laughs> have seen me paint almost all night long. Some of those like seven-hour episodes. Oh my goodness! I should I probably don't want to jinx myself. I mean, who knows? Maybe you, you will find me here still painting this painting seven hours from now. Hopefully not. I also got brand new contacts that uh, are supposedly um, not bifocals. They don't use that word anymore. Not bifocals. Um, graduated? I, don't, I have no idea how that works with uh, how you can have. That has made a huge difference because usually by this time my eyes are super crossed. And I'm having to kind of like do details, like standing back as far as possible because I can barely focus on the matter at hand in front of me. Lisa says, it's so fun to watch you paint, Michael. And Lolly says, oh man, imagine in those moments of procrastination, Michael decided, nah, I won't bother to paint today. Imagine how much amazing art we would have all missed out on. <laughs> uh, Kathy says, that sounds so familiar, Michael. I love picking up a paintbrush and mixing paints, but I sit. Maybe I should stand. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um... Sitting versus standing. Well, obviously, I'm standing. Um, there's something about it that might help put off the 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 urge to kind of lean back and fall asleep. Definitely, once I sit down, I start almost immediately start to feel tired and want to fall asleep. Versus, pretty hard to fall asleep when you're standing. Now this area, I could use a ruler to do some of this stuff, but, you know, it's, uh, everything, like, William Blake always just seems so, like, um, everything is, like, 
handmade. Everything is very, like, some things are pretty wonky in his work. And I feel like hand painting these gets some of the wonkiness in his, his work in here. And I mean that in the best way possible. Like, I think that goes back to one uh, near the very beginning of the episode when I was talking about, you know, what it is, what is it about English culture that has such a, um, that has made William Blake such a beloved character. Um... Because in so many ways, he's he's sort of like the last person one might expect to uh, to be elevated so high within British culture. I mean, he's he's a rebel. I mean, I, I, you know, it's kind of it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess every culture kind of raises its rebels high. Like, even Guy Fawkes, speaking of Halloween, I mean, I, you, a debate would be as to, you know, I think Guy Fawkes' night began as, as a, like, burning his body in effigy, because Guy Fawkes um, famously tried to well, or is at least accused of trying to blow up Parliament, right, and and topple the government. So this kind of anarchist-like action, and yet, so it's kind of like, well, why? And so originally, as far as I understand, Guy Fawkes Night was all about um, celebrating the death of this traitorous fellow. Um... Clearly, as time has passed, there's people who who have found him to be an inspiring person and not a villain at all, like someone who is standing up against authority. Like here in Canada, a character, like we have uh, a figure like Louis Riel, who's a very famous Métis uh, leader who uh, kind of led a, a uprising against the Canadian government in the 1800s and was executed, tried, he was finally tracked down, executed, and was seen as like a, a, a villain, a, a, a and yet today he's celebrated as by by majority of people maybe not everybody but by by you know there's louis riel day a, a holiday is that in, must be in manitoba probably so it's interesting how some of these figures go from being public enemy Number one, like, you know, like a Bonnie and Clyde, I guess, or to being national heroes. Well, that's interesting. A lot of stuff I just spent the last <laughs> bit doing wasn't on camera. Great job, Michael. Awesome. Okay. I want to, since I've started using this other brown, maybe it could, should lighten it up just a bit.
<laughs> I mean, I'm having a ball painting. Again, this is going back to the question about just how you can paint for hours. I'm really having a ball. Uh, uh, Lolly says, organic wonkiness is part of the charm, isn't it? Totally. And Lolly says, maybe it's because William Blake is a bit of an eccentric. And in Britain, we love eccentrics. Totally. I guess I'm, it's like, why though? Like, I, in Canadian culture, is there any eccentric? I mean, Emily Carr was kind of eccentric. What was that guy, Troy? The guy who built the bear costume. Oh my goodness, that guy. <laughs> That's a great... Um, I don't think in, in Canada we really have a s celebrate eccentric people so much that I can think of. No. Anyway, let's move on here and blow dry. Lisa says, I want to see you splatter lots of, what, what does that say, lots of, it's covered up by this, lots of gold paint all over the end, uh, <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's put Put some black back into this background. Uh, let's put a little bit of glazing fluid in here just to keep it a little bit transparent. <clears throat> 
So I use a small brush as well as a big brush to do like kind of fine details like this so that I can maybe do get close to an edge and paint that edge and then integrate that line back into the rest of the painting so it's not just so that I don't get all these little ridges of, of thick paint. Lolly says, hey, Michael, did your little Edie do anything special for Halloween? Will she be trick-or-treating today? Oh, yeah, she did. I don't know how long she lasted. She's out there with her mom. Um, but uh, last year, we didn't last that long. We got a couple houses away, and I think the whole situation kind of overwhelmed her a little bit. You, you know, maybe a year older, she feels a little bit different, but... You know, it was, it's pretty chaotic on uh, Halloween. All those kids running around. I think she just was like, oh. She almost got run over a few times by some older, you know, 10, 12-year-old kids. And <laughs> our daughter has, has a mind of her own. And if... Uh, she doesn't want to do something she's not gonna do it and she's like yep yeah, no i'm done i'm done we're gone like, okay <laughs> she just wanted to be carried around and so that's fair I'm not gonna force her to stay out any longer than she's not not having it so I don't know I will get the report as to how things went of course and we'll see darkening in. Some of the neighborhoods certainly stocked up on fireworks tonight. Just going off like wild out there.
I know there is some sort of little signature hidden in there. I'm going to just omit that just because it's so small. And I think in mine it might kind of really be distracting and take away from it. But feel free to put that in yours if you feel so inclined. Or you know what, maybe let's work our way from the top down so I can, don't have to get my worry about getting paint all over the place.
So there's some black coming over top of that. I'm, I'm trying my best to keep that black a little bit transparent so that I'm not just laying this big, thick layer of paint over top of there. I want uh, some of that purpley reds to come through. You know, like on a side note, just as I'm doing this here, you know, the way that um, William Blake has used light and dark here, like this bright light shining through in exactly the right place so that he can have these dark areas of the muscle is just absolute brilliant, genius level. Thank you. 
let's darken the, the, the sky or the whatever this is back here. Oops, of course it's not on camera. Story of my life. Uh, Lolly says, crazy to think William Blake saw this fella. Ever so slightly terrifying having this guy show up in your house. Yeah, just a little, a little, little bit. Some little demon showing up with a cauldron of blood that it's sipping from. Yeah, mildly, mildly disturbing. But I guess if you're William Blake and you've been seeing visions all of your life, it's not such a big deal. It's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, another demon. Pass me my sketchbook. Let's uh, let's do. It. The demon's like, what? What? You're not scared? <laughs> You're like, no, no, no. Just uh, oh, I like how I like you look. You look really menacing. That or you look really menacing in that position. Just hold. Can you hold that for a second? <laughs> blood, blood. Want to eat brains? Okay, okay, okay. Eat some brains in a minute. But I just need to get this drawing done. Just uh, stop moving around so much. You're really making my life difficult. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh yes, I was gonna do the forehead here. 
So I'm just going to take a little bit of glazing fluid. Get a little bit of black on there, just a small amount, because I just want to kind of get a little few like, wrinkles on his head here in places. Let's get a little bit of some teeth going on here. Take some white. I'm going to make it a little bit gray because I don't want just pure white teeth. It's kind of like a green tongue, right? So let's take some, um, oops, maybe a little bit too much. Let's take a bit more. Let's get a bit of white in here. Put a little bit, so this is just a uh, cool blue, cool yellow, and white, and a little bit of glazing fluid just to make it a little bit more fluid so I can paint with it a little bit easier. that for a second let that dry if I want to come back with a little bit more intense green don't mind that as it is right now but let that dry off uh, what was I gonna do oh yeah a little bit more black
<laughs> Lolly says, uh, Although you've made him a very handsome-looking devil in your painting, Michael, the demon would be flattered, I'm sure. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I like that. Now I'm just wondering about this cup here. Let's just take a moment to back out. Oh, you know, I was going to do some toenails. So I'm just using my gray. So those are a little bit too bright. I'm not super happy with how that looks. So I'm gonna, I'll probably glaze over them in a little bit, but I'm just gonna move on for a moment. I wanna, like, since I have this toenails, or, or uh, do I wanna do fingernails? Make them a little bit white. that's better than the just bright white or yellow nails there. do something with that chalice. I'm just at that point where I can't really ignore it any longer. Let me just blow dry all this. <laughs> Gotta get this devil a manicure. <laughs> Well, maybe it would look good as kind of orange. Because this is kind of yellow and red and brown. Hmm. 
Must be white in there somewhere. Don't know about a peachy color. I think I want it to be just orange. Swarm yellow. Let's take a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. It's closer to the original. I mean, maybe the blue was okay at some stage. I think I do want to put some... There was blood sloshing around in there. It would be just pouring over the edge, though. And would that look like blood? I kind of want it to be like bright red. Would that would it be identifiable as blood? <clears throat> Let me think. Let's see. Should we just do it? Let's take some white and red. Just want to put a drip under here. Should 
put a drip? Uh, Lolly says, uh, why don't you like the chalice, Michael? I don't know if I see the problem. Oh, the color. I think a little shading between his hand and the chalice looks a bit n not obviously separated, if you know what I mean. Totally. I think a little shading is what I meant. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Great idea. Um... <clears throat> Let's see. Let's... How should we do this? Let's take a bit of let's take a bit of this color here. Bring it over to our black. Let's see the original here. Blow dry this. I'm gonna learn my lesson. Blow dry it. Okay, now let's just take some just black.
<laughs> Lolly says, that's it. Perfect. It's looking so cool. I can't wait to try this one myself. That's so sweet of you, Lolly. Okay, let's take some red. Bright red. blow dry I know it looks okay on camera but it's in person not to put some blood on his mouth and stuff but maybe that's maybe that's enough maybe that's okay okay so almost done here in fact let's Okay, so I just want to do a few last little bit finishing touches here, and I just want to maybe darken the toenails and stuff. Otherwise, I think we're just about done. So, um, I'm just going to take my glazing fluid in black. Just go over these toenails and just darken them down a little bit. Just trying to just reposition 
his eyes so that he's looking a little bit further down into the goblet of blood. The goblet of blood. Okay, getting there. <clears throat> just do a little bit more with this glazing fluid. Just darken it a little bit down. Hmm, there's a little shadow back here. Do I want to put that in there?
I don't know, I think that's probably good enough. Right? Okay. So. We made it to the end here a little bit longer than I expected, as always. But, you know, I, I think it was worthwhile. You know, as I said, I could have probably stopped a couple hours ago, but I kind of just got into this painting. So, before we do that, just a quick reminder to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. If um, you were painting along with me today, uh, I encourage you to take a photograph of William Blake's, your version of William Blake's Ghost of a Fleet. Join our Facebook group and upload to the Facebook group this Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. We're going to do another feedback episode, so I would love to celebrate your work. And if you're interested, I can give you a little bit of feedback on how to maybe make it even better, if that's at all possible. And if you want to support the channel with a small donation, as little as a dollar through PayPal, through the Super Chat, or an e-transfer, or a check in the mail, all of the links are down below. My email's on the Facebook group and on my website. Those links are below. So, how did things turn out here? There's the original. And then there's my version. Um, which is actually roughly... You know, the original was about that big, you know, so about the size of a paperback novel. Um, and so I had a little bit more room to play, and yet still I feel like um, I wasn't able to capture all the nuance, especially like the muscles in the back. That's something that, that William Blake just seemed to love to do. He loved to draw musculature, kind of from the same tradition as maybe Michelangelo. Um, I do feel like when I look at this, there's something maybe a little bit awkward, maybe with his back leg here and his butt. Maybe I could darken that in a little bit. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what needs to be done there. Um, I might just, as I'm looking at it, just blow dry this. I think I do feel a little bit of a need. Like what? Some kind of muscle. Ooh, I don't know if that's good at all. Maybe it's okay. Maybe that's okay. I'll just walk away. Okay, so let's zoom in and just take a quick look at a few of these details. How about we'll go down to the feet first. So, you know, it's pretty hard to determine what details are what here on the figure. Um, so, I sort of did my best, used a little bit of my imagination to see if I could uh, bring out some of those details in the... I think there's maybe some big claw toenail-y things there. Um, you can see also I, I definitely darkened in the background in between his legs. There's a little bit of a highlight there. I just darken that down, and same thing on the 
right hand side there. Uh, just for the sake of, of just simplifying, making my life a little bit easier, one less kind of gradient to worry about. As I said, there was a signature, I think, I don't know what that says, W. Blake, and does that say Flea, or looks like what, E, R, E, X, E, or something, maybe it's a date, perhaps, I'm not sure. But there is something happening there, maybe another shadow, maybe another curtain there that I've omitted. Um, I think the curtain turned out pretty well. It's kind of hard to, to determine how his looked, like, that, the kind of crunchiness of the curtain is, is definitely very odd. I think that's probably the um, uh, the gold leaf. Maybe that's just the gold, the paint flaking off the gold leaf. Okay, what, what am I doing here, Michael? We're up there. Let's just look at the curtain in the top right corner. I think pretty good. The colors are, are close. Maybe they could have been even more green on that edge. Um, and perhaps maybe I could have even have darkened a little bit more so it's not just light, dark, but maybe a little bit more of a transition from dark to light. Um, let's go across to the other curtain on the other side. Oh, and there's Paula. I didn't know you were in the chat this whole time, Paula. You're so quiet. Well, have a great night, Paula. Um, you can see also, I, of course, I omitted that other star there. Just, it, uh, you know, I don't, maybe, I'm not sure. Is that, I, I guess I just assumed that this is a curtain. And that that's a, that, that to me it didn't make sense that there would be a star in front of the curtain. But maybe... Maybe that's something else. Maybe that's like a shooting star or something. I don't know. Um, what else did I want to look at? Oh, I did want to just sort of just kind of note the um, this bright light that's shining out there, almost like a little spotlight from a, kind of maybe the star glowing out that way. And I just wanted to kind of just point out that if you saw, you know, early on in the video. I painted stuff there, and then the paint that I even dried, and I wiped it away. And it's not perfect, but it's also not bad, and maybe also kind of gives us kind of odd little texture back there. But just that just demonstrates that you know you can scrub back into the surface, remove some paint even after it's mostly dried, and you know, paint a little bit of yellow and putting mature back in its place if, this, if some of the canvas is exposed. Uh, let's just look at the chalice there. Again, it was not clear to me what this, in his painting, what's going on right here. If that's a big fingernail, or I sort of imagined it was the bottom of like a goblet, you know, like the the you call that the is that the flute no anyway the, the thing that makes the goblet stand um so i kind of just made that a little bit more solid obviously i added a little bit of blood dripping out there just to um because that's sort of supposed to be what apparently this ghost of a flea is doing is drinking blood from a goblet and couldn't see it in his but, you know, I have the advantage of having a much larger surface to, to paint on, so maybe... And also, again, like his tongue, it's hard to really tell what that looks like, or even his facial features. Maybe he was a little bit more scaly, and mine, he's kind of a little bit more fleshy. But, uh, anyway, well, maybe let's also just look at that other hand. His other hand here, I've definitely made it look very... Um, like Nosferatu, kind of long vampire-like claws. Um, and I'm not super happy with the way the, the, the musculature that he did, but I think it's okay. Good enough for government work, as my grandfather used to say. Ha <laughs> ha. 
So if that doesn't give you nightmares, and not just the painting, but the story behind this wild painting, then I, I don't know. Uh, you, you are have a, uh, I don't know, more courage, stronger stomach than I. So once again, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thank you, everyone, for painting along with me, for joining me, for staying up so late. I don't know what time it is in England, Lolly, but it's probably like 5 in the morning. Go to bed, everybody. Uh, maybe keep a light on. You never know what might be stalking the shadows. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you again on Thursday morning for our feedback episode. Good night. Ha 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 ha.